You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. There is nothing pretty these days in state capitals around the nation wrestling with state budgets, facing plummeting debt revenues and demands for services. This week in Columbus, the Ohio House of Representatives adopted its version of the next biennium budget. Although Republicans hold a commanding 62 to 37 seat majority in the House, 13 Republicans bolted on this budget, requiring the House leadership to round up five urban black Democrats to form a, uh, forge a thin 53 to 46 majority for the budget. The House sets the budget uh, at $48.5 billion for the next two years, which is $600 million less than requested by Governor Bob Taft. To fund the budget, the House has proposed a temporary one cent additional sales tax and an expansion of the tax uh, to include services as t uh, such as tattooing, tanning, and towing. Voters will be given the option of replacing that sales tax in November when they are permitted to vote on the installation of electronic slot machines or lottery uh, terminals at Ohio racetracks. I am joined this morning by two members of the Ohio House of Representatives. Gene Schmidt is a Republican who represents the 66th district in Claremont County. Representative Schmidt is in her second term and is in the vice chair of the Human Services Subcommittee of the Finance and Appropriations Committee. And Tyrone Yates, a Democrat in his first term representing the 33rd district on the east side of the city of Cincinnati. He is a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Welcome to Newsmakers. Tyrone, welcome back. Thank you, Dan. Um, this is all very complicated and the numbers just sort of swim. So let's see what, if we can get the essentials here. In terms of cuts. The, the word is that this budget is a $600 million cut, but it's a $600 million cut versus Governor Taft's proposal. Is that correct? Yes. Is it a cut versus last year's or the current actual budget, or is it an increase over this year's budget? In some respects, it's a cut because we've done so many corrective budgets since the 124th General Assembly that it depends upon where you're placing the baseline uh, for your definition of cut. Okay, and that's something to keep in mind. Over the last two years, the legislature has had to make how many? Four corrections? Four corrective budgets, including one that we did in early March uh, prior to adopting the budget for this biennium. And all of that is because of squeeze in terms of the reduction of income due to the sluggish economy, basically, is, exactly. that, is what it comes down to. Tyrone, one of the interesting things that I did try to point out here is that uh, five urban-based Democrats voted for this budget. You were one of those. Why? What is it that was in this budget that you felt you could come over and vote for it? Well, I think the alternative would have been so much worse. There was not a majority that uh, Speaker Householder could obtain among Republicans. Uh, he needed some uh, Democratic votes somewhere to pass a budget that I think was uh, more responsible than the alternative would have been if he had had to have gotten the votes from the uh, more conservative members of the legislature. What did you get out of this budget that you couldn't have gotten if, if he had to get those votes from the, as you say, more conservative Republicans? Well, I'll tell you what was absolutely critical uh, to me. There were actually four things. One is the essential restoration of the library funds and up to 98 percent of the local government fund, which was close to 1.4 billion dollars. There were two other issues that uh, Speaker Householder agreed to. One was not to cut the estate tax in Ohio, which would have been a cut to local governments of $425 million. And the other was a sweeping residency bill, which would have permitted uh, police officers to live any place in the state rather than uh, cities like Cincinnati or Columbus or Cleveland or smaller municipalities wanting to retain those officers uh, uh, in the areas. Okay. So those were four critical uh, things that would not have been in the budget uh, had we not voted for it. Gene, in your, in your caucus, in the Republican caucus, there were obviously lots of Republicans who bolted on this one. You voted for it. Let's, yes. let's be clear about that. Uh, 
what did those 13 Republicans who bolted, what did they want to see happen? They wanted to see us balance the budget without having to raise taxes. Unfortunately, had we done that, we would have had to have cut critical services for the residents in the state of Ohio. In addition to slashing the local government fund, we would have also had to have really seriously cut the Medicaid budget, which uh, helps our most vulnerable population. For instance, we would have had to have gotten rid of CHIP Plus, or CHIP 2. CHIP 2 is for that working class poor for their children for their health insurance. That would have been gone. We would have had to have cut the podiatry and the dental and the vision services for our most vulnerable population, and those are critical health care services. One of the things that one of the members, uh, the Republican members who voted against this, told me uh, in talking to him on the phone last night is if we can't cut podiatry, if we can't cut vision in the midst of a budget crisis, then we just simply don't have the guts to ever do any serious cutting. Now you're saying those are essential services. Dan, those are critical services, especially for the elderly. When you look at an elderly person, you have to look at their physical condition. Number one, their skin becomes very, very sensitive and thin, so they bruise easily. They also begin to lose feeling in their feet. And if you've ever, I hate to be so graphic, but if you've ever seen an elderly person's toenails, they're extremely hard to deal with. If you don't have a professional dealing with the maintenance of those feet, you can complicate their lives to the point that they can have serious injuries result either in ingrown toenails that would uh, cause uh, a removal of a toe or a foot or somebody that doesn't know what they're doing causing an infection. So this isn't going out and getting your feet done uh, for fun. This is a critical care service. The vision aspect, what we were really doing is saying you can't go to an optometrist, but they still could go to an ophthalmologist. And actually that would cost more to the state budget than uh, having the option to go to an optometrist for most of our daily eye care. Tyron, were these sorts of Medicaid issues important to you as well? You, you didn't mention those in your list of four, but did you agree with the preservation of these sorts of services? Yes, as a matter of fact, the five uh, Democrats who joined uh, the Republicans insisted that those things be included. Uh, as the Speaker presented them to us in negotiations, they were off the table and we insisted that they uh, be in. You know, one of the things, uh, the sales tax, this one cent sales tax, which is a temporary sales tax, is for the next two years unless it's replaced by this video. My understanding is it's supposed to generate about 1.2 billion a year, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Now, if we adopt the video terminals, the projections I see on that is that it's supposed to generate, which would substitute for the sales tax, it's supposed to generate anywhere from 400,000 to maybe 800,000. You mean 400 million to 800 million? Yeah, 800 million, thank you, gee, the zero is <laughs> just problem. I know, it's all, it's all um, numbers. But the point is, if we adopt the video lottery terminals as a replacement for the sales tax, don't we end up with another budget deficit? The way that it has been explained to me, no, because we would still have the sales tax to get us through the first part of the biennium. And in that one cent sales tax, there is a little bit of a cushion there. The second is, is that those are very conservative numbers of what VLTs would actually uh, bring to the table. More realistic numbers are in the $800 million range, but uh, we're a very cautious group of individuals and uh, want to uh, you know, use the lower number but not the higher. When you look at uh, VLTs throughout the country, uh, they're generating much more than the numbers that have been presented. Governor Taft has suggested that he will veto the VLT portion of the. Can he veto the VLT? Uh, let's, let's just. He can line item he, veto yes. anything in the budget. He can, he, he can even if the Senate adopts it and it's supposed to go to the public, he could veto it before the public even gets to vote? Yes, and I think the, the truth is, as from the Democratic side, uh, we believe that um, the VLT, in a way, was a, a cover for the sales tax. We believe that there's little doubt but that the governor will veto that. It will be difficult to get an override. And likely what you'll have in the long run, 
because there's an expectation that the voters actually uh, will veto that in a referendum. So what uh, the Democrats feel, without knowing whether that's true or not, is that what this really is is a temporary one cent sales tax for two years to get us through the biennium with the uh, option for the uh, lottery terminals as kind of a cover to make the package more palatable. And that's why I voted against that portion of the bill before it came forward. I was prepared to vote for the one cent sales tax as an increase without the tax reforms that didn't come out of ways and means if that was the only option. Actually, the VLTs have been something that uh, many Republicans in both the House and the Senate have wanted for a number of years. Uh, we are, a, uh, our community is a border community to Indiana, and so we see that uh, three-fourths of the uh, cars that are at uh, Argosy are from our side of the uh, aisle. Uh, rolling the VLTs into the package um, is something that was a very strong Republican sentiment uh, because we really wanted to see the voters have an opportunity to say yes or no to VLTs. Do uh, you support VLTs? Not, not just giving people a choice, that's easy, but do you support VLTs? Personally, I do for several reasons. Number one, I understand the argument that it is a sin and it, and it can lead to an addiction. But I also understand that many people like that kind of an opportunity and are very responsible with that opportunity. Number two, when we look at the horse racing industry in Ohio, uh, it is uh, failing uh, at, a, at an alarming rate simply because of our border states that have VLTs at those racetracks. That is a destination point for gambling anyway. You go to a, a horse, River Downs to gamble. And so what we're doing is allowing the voters to say, in addition to going to bet on horses, they can also play the video lottery terminals. Does anybody in this whole debate about sales tax, VLTs, did anybody say, one of the things about sales taxes, traditionally the argument is they're regressive. They hurt the, the lower income people worse than they hurt. Anybody say we ought to adjust the rates of the income tax? Well, um, a lot of those, that package was in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the governor put forth the tax reform package that would have generated $1.5 billion, and uh, many of us on the other side of the aisle, we were hoping that those tax reforms, uh, because it would have lowered the rates for Ohio's lowest income uh, workers, it would have actually lowered the rates for some of the highest income workers, but broadened that tax base. Uh, so there was a lot of reform, but for at least what I saw, frankly, I saw a good many of the lobbyists coming in and I think at least at this stage, they felt they didn't get a chance to take a proper swipe at the issues, and so those issues have been delayed. I'm hoping as we finish off the year that a number of those issues uh, will get a fair airing and that we can have some tax reform. One, one of the things that came out of the Ways and Means Committee was a different way of taxing uh, the business community in the state of Ohio, and uh, what was talked about was a factor tax, to tax activity instead of taxing product uh, what you're producing. The problem with the factor tax is it really seriously affected people that were in a high high sales bracket uh, of activity but low profit margin. People that are in retail uh, such as uh, convenience stores, uh, delicatessens, people that sell uh, uh, petroleum to uh, uh, to gas stations, et cetera, high, high amount of sales, gross sales, but the net is very, very narrow. Well, and so that factor tax really had to be adjusted. And, and the Ways and Means Committee did an excellent job in fleshing out some good ideas, just not enough time to get them resolved. Uh, even if the Representative Schmidt is correct about that, sitting on Ways and Means, we never saw any of those people we saw the big co corporations who came in and said, we don't want it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's something down the road, and it's another set of complications, and I'm running out of time. So let, let me focus. This now goes to the Senate. Yes. Yes. Um, how long will that take? What's the timeline, and what's your expectation? We have to have this budget balanced by June 30th, and uh, we've got uh, just a few months to do that. I think that the Senate will have their version wrapped up sometime in May. Uh, it will be very different than ours. Uh, I have a strange... What will be the essential differences? Uh, I think uh, in the way we've restored some services, in the way we've cut some... Uh, 
things in the budget. Uh, I think that we will then have to go to conference because I don't believe that we will have uh, enough people to so want to So in other concur. words, and we're almost out of time, Tyrone, do you think that places like the library and local governments still have a lot to worry about? No, I think that they'll be made essentially whole. Okay. I think there'll be improvements. I think the Senate will add money to primary education. There's been a $350 million cut. It was palatable because that cut really isn't effective until the second year of the biennium. And those of us who voted for the package think that the first year can hold what we have in place and then we can use the year to fight for more. Okay, so it's not in those areas, it's going to be in other areas. Okay, exactly. a continuing story. We'll have you back. Thank you very much. Thanks for trying to make this clear because it's very complex. And I know you're just on, still on a very little bit of sleep. You've just finished this yesterday. I really appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Stay tuned after the break, a sneak preview of an important new documentary that will be aired this week on Channel 12. Takes out his shotgun and points it right at his head. And it's, I mean, right here. And he says, he says, you have Jews. I want your Jews. Welcome back. Late last year, the award-winning 12 News team of reporter Jeff Hirsch and videographer Jeff Barnhill joined Cincinnatian Henry Blumenstein on an amazing journey. They journeyed to Holland, where Blumenstein had been sheltered as, by a Dutch family from the Gestapo, and they traveled to Auschwitz in Poland, where many of his family perished. Here is a short look at the beginning of that journey. points it right at his head. He says, you have Jews. I want your Jews. She asked them, uh, uh, I have a Jewish boy, and can you take him in your house? And my grandparents said, it's okay. Bring it, the boy here. This is my mother's grave. This is where she's buried. This is where she died. See, I'm 67 years old, and I am one of the youngest survivors. So I have a lot of work to do. His name is Henry Blumenstein, and by all rights, he should have come through this gate here at Auschwitz never to return, a victim of Adolf Hitler's final solution. But Henry Blumenstein was able to come here as an adult on an emotional journey, recreating his past, understanding why he is alive, and finding family. The lesson is that where there is darkness, there is light. And you just gotta, you, you have to be lucky enough to attract that light, and I was lucky enough to attract I am now joined by 12 News reporter Jeff Hirsch, who wrote and produced Finding Family, which we've seen here on Channel 12 on Saturday night, uh, this coming Saturday night right. at 8 o'clock. That's Jeff, uh, how did you meet Henry Blumenstein? Well, you know, in a sense, it's almost your doing. Uh, you may not remember this, but this is the time for Holocaust Awareness Weeks in Cincinnati right. put on by the uh, Center for Holocaust and Humanity Education at Hebrew Union College. Last year, right around this time, Henry Blumenstein was speaking to schools around Cincinnati about the Holocaust and his personal experiences. And you brought that to my attention, and we went and listened to him speak, and we did a story about his speech. And a woman came over from Holland. Her name is Schalkia Dijkstra, <clears throat> and she is the great, no, she's the granddaughter, so many relatives in this story, she is the granddaughter of the couple, the Dutch couple which saved Henry. So we did the story, good story, we were happy with it. And sometime later, Russell Wyman of the Holocaust Center called and said, would you like to go over to Europe with Henry because he's going over to have a reunion with the relatives of the family who saved him? Of course, we said yes. And so we went, and we also then went to Auschwitz where his mother was uh, killed, and we, as you saw, pretty emotional. 
And had he ever been back? since he come yeah he'd been back but not quite under the same auspices he never had that same reunion uh that he had with the family he had a reunion with the, the dykstra family and and what was so important to him to the dyke to meet with the dykstra family obviously he knew some of them because he grew up with some of them uh, some of the children but i'd say 90 percent of the people who were there at this reunion which you will see in the piece didn't know who he was didn't know his story and important to him did not know that their family members, their grandparents, great grandparents, great great parents, did this very courageous thing and sheltered Henry for three years during World War II. Kept so, him alive. So this wasn't a story that got passed down no, in that family. Right, exactly. It, it, and this is real interesting because Holocaust survivors, one of the things I have found in doing these stories and just happen to know it, many of them, uh, you can almost liken it to a lot of things like Vietnam. They just didn't want to talk about it. it. They survived. It was horrible. It was painful. Put it in the back of their minds and try not to bring it forward. The same was true with the Dykstras. That was the name of the family. Johannes was the, was the father, and Schalke, the same name as the granddaughter, Dykstra, the Dutch couple who saved Henry. They didn't talk about it either. I mean, they, the, the attitude, and we learned, and, and it, it shows up pretty well in the piece because we talked to some of the relatives, the surviving relatives. They, they did it. They were happy they did it. They did the right thing. Move on. Hmm. And so you had this intersection now of, of Henry bringing back these memories and feeling this sense of mission now after repressing it for all these years of wanting to go to the schools and talk to children about the Holocaust and also talk about the Dykstras who were heroic, who in the face of absolute danger said, we need to take how, this child in and hide him. How did they hide him? Part of it was hiding, and you'll see it, part of it was hiding him in plain sight, and part of it was hiding when he was hiding. Uh, the little bit that you saw where Henry took out sort of his imaginary gun and pointed at his head, that actually happened um, <clears throat> in, in this farm where he lived. It was a farmhouse. It was in northern Holland. Um, it's rural now, so if you can think 60 years ago, it was unbelievably rural. The house was very, very small. Uh, and we went there, and you'll see us. We go there. We go into the, the uh, barn where he hid, into the potato cellar where he hid. And uh, he would uh, sometimes hide. The, the incident where the German soldier came up to uh, Johannes, Henry called him Ohm, which means uncle in Dutch. And Ohm sort of kind of stared him down and said, you, know, you want Jews? You find them. And Henry was hiding in the barn. <laughs> uh, he would also hide in the potato cellar, which is a big thing, I guess, in, in rural Holland. Everybody has a potato cellar. Um, he would also hide in plain sight. He, would, he, was a, he was an altar boy. He was a Jewish altar boy. A Jewish boy. altar boy. Right. At a, and we went to this church, and Henry goes back to the church with the family, and he sort of was hiding in plain sight because there were, there were Nazi soldiers who came to the church stood in the back. He was doing his uh, altar boy duties and, and they didn't catch him. What's the, on this journey mm -hmm. that you went with him, emotions raw for him out front? Yeah, I, I, yes. I mean, the, the thing he says at Auschwitz when we get there is either I, uh, either I am going to be incredibly angry or I'm going to feel nothing. And it kind of wavers between the two. Um, on the one hand, he's sort of numbed by it, and on the other hand, he is just so angry that something could happen, A, to his mother, and B, to anybody, and C, to six million anybody's. Uh, it, it just, it's just really uh, powerful. What about for you? You know, part of it is when you're doing a story and <clears throat> you're working, you have this tunnel vision, and you, you just kind of look straight ahead and you've got to deal with, are we getting this interview, are we getting this picture? So we were at Auschwitz for two days. And, and Henry went to Auschwitz to try to get some answers about exactly what happened to his mother. I mean, he, how long she was there, what specifically happened to try to get these answers. The first day we were there, it, it was almost a work day. Well, it was a work day, you know, getting these shots, and you're aware of which you're obviously. The second day, Jeff Barnhill, the photographer, and I went back um, by ourselves just to get some other shots, and we weren't doing interviews, and we weren't running around, and just kind of, just the enormity of it all, it's, it's, it, makes you, it makes you sick, really. I mean. If you didn't know what it was, if you just dropped down off of Jupiter, you would look around and you'd think it was an old factory that had been abandoned like you know, in Youngstown or Pittsburgh. It, but it's a death factory. And, and it goes on and on. And there's these chimneys, which are sort of like almost unintended tombstones. Uh, and then there's a crematorium where you saw Henry right. in there talking about his mother. 
Well, we're just about out of time, but I mean, obviously this is a journey for you and for Jeff Barnhill, and, and the two of you are such an incredible team, oh, so thanks. I'm really looking forward to this. I want to remind everybody that this special uh, is this fr uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday night at 8 o'clock, uh, on here on Channel 12, April the 19th, and right. people will really want to be sure to see yeah, this. It's powerful. Thank you for doing this, thank and you. look forward to seeing the whole thing. I haven't only seen clips, so thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We leave you this morning with some scenes from Auschwitz and some silence.